But by making the unconscious conscious, you get to start to have choice in your relationships, in your happiness, in your parenting, in your career. Until we make the unconscious conscious, it will rule our life and we'll call it fate. Welcome to Beyond Theory, a podcast powered by Meadows Behavioral Healthcare that brings you in-depth conversations from the front lines of mental health and addiction recovery. I'm David Kondos. Author Neil Strauss rose to fame capturing the wild world of rock stars and pickup artists. And he thought his life seemed normal by comparison until he needed to seek help for his own issues. So what did that experience teach him about how relationships, sex, and trauma are all connected? Let's get out of the abstract and see how this applies in the real world. It's time to go Beyond Theory. I'm Neil Strauss. I write a lot of books. I've written a lot of articles for Rolling Stone and the New York Times, uh, maybe 10, 11, 12 New York Times bestsellers, not all sometimes in collaboration with other people. Also do a podcast called To Live and Die in LA where we, where I've looked for missing people and there's actually connection in one of them to the work of the Meadows. Wow. Okay. Okay. Well, we can, we can circle back around to that. We interviewed a Meadows trained therapist for part of the podcast. It was a number one iTunes podcast and it really was a true crime uh, podcast, but it really relates to this. It's part of it related to this work. To the mind. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, Neil Strauss, thank you so much for your time today. It's great to have you here. Uh, so like you said, you've written a lot of best-selling books, um, uh, other works in journalism. Uh, two of your most notable ones are books about relationships. So you did, you did the game, uh, you know, kind of more about uh, how to meet women, how to, how to start that potential relationship, and then you followed it up with The Truth more recently, how to kind of maintain those relationships. And so kind of just to kind of lay the groundwork for this conversation, uh, wh what are some of the things that people tend to get wrong about commitment, relationships? What, is, what are some of the lies that are per perpetuating the uh, misadventures with relationships? Everyone has their own set of misconceptions they're dealing with, right? Mm -hmm. So, and, and they come from that your first experience of love and attachment which is, uh, you know, your childhood caretakers, be they present or absent. So, and then some of the common ones are, some, there's so many, there's so many, and they're, they're so unique to, to everybody, but I'll tell you some of the common ones. Mm -hmm. Well, some of the common ones is um, everyone I love will leave me, right? So, so that you get into this, and these can become self-fulfilling prophecies that then reinforce the, the, the false belief. Uh, another one is, uh, I'm dating this person, not accepting as they are, but hoping they will change. Uh, and it's my job to change or save or rescue uh, this person I'm with, which is which is a, a horrible, dysfunctional enterprise to get into with a in a relationship. Uh, another one is uh, is trust. This person, I'm they, I'm not enough belief, uh, or or that this person is going to going to cheat. And uh, and walking into a relationship with trust issues. Another one is that uh, is is um, God. There's so many. I could really I could really go on. But but the there's there's so many. We walk. There's a there's a great line from James Hollis, the Jungian therapist. And I'm going to paraphrase it. But the idea is when we ask them to get in a relationship with us, we're saying, Hey, can you walk across this field of minds that I have laid down, and see if you can reach me. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so in the in the truth, you were very personal about your own story, your own journey. And you you even talked uh, uh, in the book about your experience of going to treatment, of being part of a treatment program for for I guess what you described at the time as as sex and love addiction. Um what 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 did that experience teach you? Yeah. <laughs> so it was the crazy that man, I will say that there was a moment at the meadows that changed my life forever. And I walked in the meadows uh, because I had was in love with someone. I wanted to marry them. I cheated on them. I got caught, and I tried to figure out well why why would I why would I act outside my value system for sex that I didn't even enjoy? Uh, why would I harm my chances of a future that I wanted so much? Why would I hurt someone I love? All these questions, 
And a friend of mine said, maybe you're a sex addict uh, and you maybe should go to the Meadows and read this book by Pia Melody, which I think was facing love addiction. And, and I read that and I said, you know what? I, I don't know, but, but I really need help, <laughs> you know? So, so that's, that's really where I started. Then we had to do a timeline. The first week at Meadows, you do a timeline. And, I, and so I put on my timeline <clears throat> all of my sort of peak positive and negative childhood experiences, sat down there on the floor in the, in the group therapy room. And I remember uh, the therapist goes through it. She asks some questions and she says, you know why you've never been in a healthy relationship? And I go, no. And she's like, well, that's because your mom wants to be in a relationship with you. And as soon as she said that, uh, and then like this cold, I just felt this cold wind blow over me. And like, I just kind of collapsed in this puddle of tears. Like, and, and I don't, I didn't really understand what she meant, but like my soul did and like my heart did. Um, and that way, and all of a sudden it's like my whole past, all those stories and all that narrative, uh, all those stories, they just snapped together and formed a single narrative. It was perfectly clear that I never saw before. And, and what I love, what I love and the things I love about Pia Melody is this, this the idea, and again, please correct me if anything's wrong, uh, the, the idea of post-induction therapy and the idea is your childhood is a hypnotic induction, right? Then there's t- treatment or, or the process through which you are unhypnotized and then can enter reality. And so, and it, it's really true. We, everybody I speak to thinks their child, or a lot of people think, a certain percent of people think their childhood is normal because that's what they experienced and that's all they saw and your brain is <laughs> shaped around those. <laughs> Everything seems normal when you're in the middle of it, yeah. Yeah, no, yeah. exactly. I hear it all the time. Yeah, of course, it's just, there's, there's that form of denial called globalization and uh, my, it's okay for my wife, I say this, or my uh, ex-wife. Um, but, uh, but she's like, yeah, you know, I grew up in Mexico, like moms always hit their daughters there. Sure, but it's, I'm sure there's some moms there that don't hit their daughters. And whether that's true or not, it still causes trauma for you. I realize I'm giving a long answer, but the short version is there was that one moment of like truth and revelation that my body recognized before my brain did that changed the rest of my life. Hmm. And so do you, like looking back, do you consider that that was your turning point? That, <laughs> that, that was one of the turning points. You know, there's a funny thing about the mind, which is, uh, uh, but that, that, yeah, I see that as a turning point, but it wasn't. And I think it's good to help people's expectations be healthy around this is when we get these epiphanies, when you get these transformations, very few is the person who then now lives out of that truth. Mm-hmm. It's because these things are wired into your brain, you know, and the, and the connections reinforced over and over again through, through your, the belief system, the evidence you look for to, to support your false belief. Because of that, uh, it's, it's hard to undo the stuff and it's a, in a, and it's a journey. So you can still, mm-hmm. and I think, that one of the most frustrating parts of healing is when you when you have the awareness, but the behavior hasn't changed. Is mm-hmm. getting the awareness doesn't change the behavior, just makes you aware that you keep making the same mistake. <laughs> yeah, that's that's not helpful for the shame factor. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Man, yeah, um, yeah, and it definitely takes more than one turning point. Yeah, yeah, no, it does. It really is. It's it is a back and forth struggle, which is why. Which is why a people in relationships with the expectation someone can change are continually dis- disappointed and get into resentment, and it's just not healthy. Uh, and someone has to have their own process. You know, someone has to experience their own process, and that process is messy and it's ugly and it's back and forth. And obviously, you being engaged in their process in a relationship is your own unhealthiness. Um, and, and B is is you really have to have compassion for uh, just for your for your for yourself in this. I know people. It, I someone gave me a great quote, which is I said. You know, I feel like I've done all this work, but here I am still dealing with this issue or that issue. And they said, and it's and I quote this often is that self-improvement's like climbing a mountain, that sometimes you get the same view because in the same side of the mountain, but you're standing at a higher place. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. And so kind of piggybacking off of this, you you've also written uh on your you have a blog that that talks about this and kind of unpacking the trauma and and in that blog you wrote about how therapy and workshops things like that are great sometimes necessary work but they're not enough. And so what and this is kind of gets to what you're what you're just describing about those multiple epiphanies. Um so what are some of the things that have have worked for you to to really get you to change that mindset? Yeah, sure. And I think the first thing, and I, I'd be curious, actually, I'd ask you on this since you're there. 
I feel like most inpatient treatment programs are usually four to six weeks usually. And, and it really isn't, you know, if the, if I was to design a treatment plan that worked, maybe I'd have maybe someone to be there for nine months to a year. But of course, to get the commitment for that, and of course, the cost of that is just unfeasible. Mm. Uh, but it really, it's it's hard to really hold on to it after after that, which is it, so the it's hard to create, it's hard to create what will really work that is also will is palatable to people. So I, there's a challenge there. But for me, I think there's a three pronged approach to healing that I recommend, which is part one. Yeah. So the idea is talk therapy really doesn't work for 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 shifting and he, changing and healing trauma because it's, it's 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 the intellect the intellect is engaged through talk and the intellect is not how this stuff came in it came in somatically it came in sort of emotionally it came in unconsciously and so the intel, it, it's it's the intellect just really deals with it, it's not enough so i think that that the first step is deep experiential workshop stuff like the, like uh, the sort of survivors of course i recommend to but so many people through that program that <laughs> that that uh, and i'm so happy for everyone who goes to it's i'm so excited for them so such as a survivors program and i see, and experiential is not a lecture experiential is you're lying and collapsed in a puddle of tears on the floor you know that's 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 really what you what, so that that's one and and one is often not enough it's maybe you want to do one or two a year just to just to shake shake that trauma uh, loose um, uh, but there are many different there are many different amazing workshops to choose and I also say nothing hurts there's nothing and I've tried almost everything there's nothing that's really if it's if it's accredited or uh, respect there's nothing that really has uh, been bad for me so, l- luckily enough I think everything everything can help uh, again unless the person leading it has really make the intentions um, so that's one. Two is, I think, talk therapy, or and I recommend group therapy over talk therapy. I'll explain why in a second. But talk or group therapy for maintenance. In other words, you get this big epiphany, you get this big shift, and you return to the environment where all your problems are, are exist and still exist, and it pulls you back into it. And the great thing about having the accountability of a weekly person or group to talk to is you then say, well, I did this. And they said, oh, no, there you go again. Yeah. Uh, with the same pattern that you did before and you've done this this time, that time, and that time. So maybe now you can use the knowledge you had and change that. So you get the accountability and it keeps, the head has a way of, uh, say, if your thinking is off, you go to these workshops, uh, you have the experiences and you walk out with the truth, knowing who you are, and slowly it shifts away again. And and this can help, help keep it straight till you get it straight, if that makes sense. So that's two. And the word of talk versus group therapy. So... I found, and there are studies supporting this, that group therapy is more powerful than one-on-one therapy. And I'll give you a couple of reasons for this. Uh, one, and I'll be curious what other people have said, but one is the therapist can recommend something and I can disagree with them. I can say, okay, well, that's your perspective. You don't really know me. You have a different background. I see that, but I just disagree. But if you have a, a therapist there and five of your peers, and they're all say, no, maybe your thinking is wrong on this, you kind of have to consider it, even if you don't agree. Other thing is you can really only talk to a therapist during your office hours, but the group stays in between and really creates this amazing support group and support network. And, and, I, and I love it. I recommend it for everything. The third reason why it's great is it can be more affordable. One-on-one therapy is expensive, but if you get four or five people and you all go in together for the therapist, it actually becomes chicken cheap, cheaper and more affordable. So I'm a big fan of group therapy for all those reasons. Third thing, so we have experiential uh, multi-day workshops. We have talk talk therapy. And then the third thing is tools to use. Uh, I think we, tools to use are, are, there are moments, there are moments when we feel that trauma, we feel that old behavior pattern coming on, that trauma starting to rear its head. And if you start to recognize, you start to know the signals, Right. You know, maybe you feel the, the tingling, maybe your heart starts pounding, maybe your head starts burning, maybe you feel yourself shutting down, maybe you feel the yourself starting to get angry. And I almost think it's almost like a roller coaster. You feel it going, you feel it going up the hill, and then you can stop it till it gets to about there. And once it's there, <laughs> it's in control. The inner child has just said, I'm gonna save you, right? And, and it just keeps going till it hits the bottom, and then you feel the shame and then you can start to recover. So, so the idea of the tools is, okay, I'm, if I recognize that I'm starting to feel agitated, 
I can intervene before it's too late with these tools. As an example, reparenting. So for me, as someone who is mother enmeshed, when my partner would be, would, you know, kind of just squeeze or hold me and hug me, I would start to get like, I'd want to get them away. I'd feel like I'm getting smothered again. Mm. Right. Uh, you know, I'd feel like that, that, uh, that needy mom energy. And so my adult functional self, to use the terminology, right, would talk to my inner child and say, hey, it's okay. She's not, she's not your mom. She's not trying to use or control you. She just loves you and wants to connect. So don't worry. I got this. and I will always keep you safe. I'm handling this. But thank you. Boom. I connect. So, so I think those three things, doing them for a period of time helps, helps this stuff just, I don't want to say, uh, I want to say shrink or lessen. This trauma came in through so many different ways and being reinforced so much. You really have to make it if you want, if you want to change, you have to make it a, a, a real mission. Yeah. Yeah. And so you, you mentioned P and Melody's work uh, a, a couple of times. How would you describe the way that some of the ideas that, that she has fleshed out about childhood trauma, about, you know, repeating the patterns from, from our parents and, and so on and so forth and, and how we carry shame and trauma. How has that shaped the ways that you might view relationships today? It, it different than how you viewed them 10, 20 years ago. Yeah, no, I mean, it's it's nuts, and, I, and I'm really like, <clears throat> I don't know, I just think it's wild stuff that PM Melody, <clears throat> you know, synthesized and developed. It really is, to me, just one of the best systems for understanding relation, relationships and relational dynamics. And so, the, I guess the way I understand that, the short answer is, it's so profound that if I, if you, if I, or if you know if you really understand Pia's work and you know how someone is raised and they haven't done the work on themselves, you know who they're going to pick for relationships and how it's going to go. And vice versa, if someone's in a relationship and they describe their issues to you, you know exactly how they were raised. It's almost like seeing the matrix of relationships. Hmm. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I'm sure we could we could CGI some of uh, Pia's uh, action moves at the, into the into this video. Um, but really, is true. It really like just it's just amazing. Um, yeah. So it, uh, at one point in your book, you you described um, a situation where you were talking with some of your guy friends, and they were asking you uh, questions about commitment. And and I think you were uh, like about to be married at that time. And and how you described in the book is they were asking all the wrong questions. And I think that's, that's kind of a general, that's a common thing, like in our society in general. So what, what are the right questions? What, how should we be viewing relationships? What, what are the right questions that we should be asking? An unhealthy relationship, an unhealthy relationship is too fucked up people getting more fucked up together. Mm. A healthy relationship is too fucked up people getting unfucked up. You know, like I think, a, I really think a relationship can be a great place for growth if both people are conscious and do their own work. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. And not expecting the other person to be your savior. Yeah, be your savior, be your therapist, or be your accountability partner. It really is up to you. I think if, you, if you're getting that dynamic where your partner is helping you change or you're changing for your partner, it really is uh, an unhealthy dynamic for the relationship. Well, one other thing that you that you touch on uh, in the book is that, um, especially as men, a lot of what we learn about relationships comes from society. I mean, obviously, it comes from our our father and the people who are close to us, but also just comes more broadly from what we see around us. And obvious, and often that teaching can be toxic, whether it's you know overt or subliminal. It can it can it can be unhealthy. I mean, what what do you think? What do you think it'll take to change some of those uh, cultural factors of the, of the pieces of that puzzle to where we can, you know, maybe change the way we think about masculinity and how that is is setting up men to be in these toxic relationships? But because of that, yeah, I find yeah I find it so interesting that in this cultural discourse that we're having that is so positive in terms in terms of looking at the toxic. Uh, masculinity and looking at, at, at uh, <clears throat> some of these things, there, there's not a conversation about parenting within that. Mm. It's funny because I've been wanting to do a parenting book and there's not, there's less of an audience for that uh, than a book about 
dating or a book about relationships. You know, parenting seminars are packed. You know, I feel like the people who feel the pain, the parenting is the vulnerable child, you know, not the parent. So, so, you know, so, so there's a pr- issue there. And, and I'm really, this is really where my head and my thought process are now mm-hmm. is how can I create a, a parenting book that people will read um, who are, who, uh, that, yeah, they're just that all that, that will appeal to all parents, not all parents. Most of those parenting books go unread. You know, a lot of, not a lot of parents go to these workshops unless they feel they have a real so-called problem child. Of course, the problem is usually not the child of the family <laughs> system as we know, right? Yeah. You know, like I, it's so fascinating. It's so fascinating. Like I work with so many, in this small tangent, but we'll get back to it. I work with so many people who say I was a bad kid growing up. I'm like, okay, how are you a bad kid? You know, I would just run around the house. I was always loud. I was just noisy. I was like, oh, sounds like you were a kid, right? And your parent <laughs> called you bad to control you. And now here you are at like 40, still thinking you were a bad kid when you were literally just a kid. And the word bad that you've attached to yourself is this shameful label for your whole life mm-hmm. is just a, a controlling parent who, 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 uh, who has their own issues and has nothing to do with your inherent qualities as a human being. It's the craziest, it's the most interesting thing. And I think like, I think there are two sides to what you're talking about. And one is, can, can people, can, can, they, can the culture sort of wake up uh, or those who don't understand, really wake up and understand, see who they are truly outside of uh, the, the, the hypnotic induction, we'll say, of those first 17 or 18 years. And the second side is now, can we p- conscious, can we parent in a very conscious way? Like there might be, I think a lot of people probably go to the parenting things, they're, they're trying to con- learn to control their child. So there's not, there's not an incentive you want your child to be successful and be well, but I think people, yeah, I really want to think about that idea of, well, what's the incentive for that? When you go into <clears throat> inpatient therapy, the incentive is I want to live. <laughs> you know, usually if I, I, I might die if this doesn't happen or really hurt myself or someone else. And yet to not have the empathy for the child you're hurting yeah, there's there's one great book by uh, Dan Siegel called Parenting from the Inside Out. The, the I think he's a neuroscientist, and uh, and the the whole thesis of it is, if you want to be just do your own work. If you want to be the great parent, just make yourself healthy, and the rest will sort of come automatically. And I think it's a cool thesis. Um, all right, well, thank you, Neil. This has been wonderful. Uh, we'll leave uh, listeners with two two quick things now. Um, first of all, for someone who is interested in diving deeper on these issues, whether it's the, you know, working on yourself, whether it's the relationship piece, uh, what, what would be a book or a resource um, besides your own that, that you'd recommend to them? Let's see, uh, if they're interested in diving into this deeper, um, I mean, I think, we've, I think we mentioned a lot of the stuff, but obviously the PM Melodies Facing Love Addiction or Facing Codependence is, is great. Um, what other relationship books do I love? Um, I think, you know, I think Harville Hendrix's Getting the Love You Want is good. Um, but, you know, like you, you, if you, I also think a, a nice kind of beginner book is that book Attached, which is just a very simple look at, at what are the secure, anxious attachment relationships. I think those are good relationship resources. Uh, but I think if, I think it's, I also feel like it is funny to say this as a writer, I think books only get you so far. I think books only get you so far. And if you really want this, if you really want to make the changes, maybe start, just read a book or two to kick it off. But, but as we said before, someone said, told me once very wisely, the same head that got you into the problem won't get you out of it. So it's good. I, I, the thing I would do right now, if it would be to form that therapy group, get three or four people in similar life situations who you trust and uh, meet weekly on, on Zoom, I guess, uh, for, for the present moment or outside somewhere distanced with, and all chip in on a, on a great group therapist. Like, I think that would be an awesome idea. Mm-hmm. And again, another way to take advantage of this time to grow. Right, right. All right, to wrap up with this last thing, uh, what, what's a favorite piece of advice that, that someone gave you that's meant a lot, uh, something that you'd want to leave listeners with and pass on? I think probably the one of my favorite quotes is from Carl Jung, which do you know what quote I'm going to say or no? No, good. I mean, he he has more than one, but yeah. Until we make, and I'm obviously probably going to paraphrase it slightly, but until we make the unconscious conscious, it will rule our life and we'll call it fate.
Mm. And the idea being that in the unconscious does the, all these patterns and beliefs and things I was talking about were running my life. They were in the driver's seat of my life. The driver's seat. And until you make that unconscious conscious, you start to become aware of these patterns, and behaviors, and what their causes and what they're coming from until till you're really at the point where everything I do now and the choices I make, I know why I make them because this happened. Uh, your life will be directed by the unconscious forces and you'll think that's fate and it's out of your control. But making the unconscious conscious you get to start to have choice in your relationships, in your happiness, in your parenting, in your career, in the most important relationship, the one with yourself, and in starting to get unattached to all the stuff we cling to on the outside that we think will bring us happiness and doesn't. Neil Strauss is a 10-time New York Times bestselling author and award-winning journalist based in Los Angeles. His work has been published in Rolling Stone, Esquire, and The Wall Street Journal. Learn more about his book, The Truth, and read his blog about healing psychological wounds at neilstrauss.com. Beyond Theory is produced and hosted by me, David Condos. You can discover more from this podcast, including videos of each conversation, at beyondtheorypodcast.com. Finally, thank you for listening, and I hope you'll join us again next time for another episode of Beyond Theory.